going to talk today again about, can you run a multifamily syndication business as a side hustle? Okay. Um, I know that's going to be very uh, interesting content. That's very intriguing to a lot of us on the call um, because you're here because you, you know about multifamily syndication or you know a little bit about it and everybody's at a different level of knowledge, but you know enough about it that you want to learn more about it. And so you're, you're here, you're listening. And a lot of you, if you're not already in the space, or if you're, even if you are in the space, you're doing it and you're working a W2 job, or, or maybe you're an entrepreneur and you, you know, you're 1099 or, or whatever the case may be, but you're not doing uh, multifamily syndication um, 100% as a total source of your, of your income. And so we're going to talk today about the ins and outs of that and kind of how to achieve that. And is it achievable? Um, so we'll go ahead and dive into that. So the first thing, you know, always that you want to determine with any type of job, business opportunity, investment is determining what your financial goals are. So financial goals are, you know, do you want to retire? What age do you want to retire at? What does retirement mean for you? So do you want to retire when you're 30, 40, 50, 60? You know, do you never want to retire? And when I say retire, I want to define that. That means you do not have to work a job to receive income. That doesn't mean you sit around and do nothing. It means that your passive income exceeds your expenses. And that's where coming into determining your financial goals comes into play. So if you have um, an expense budget, you know, uh, your expenses, your bills, your cost of living, you know, let's say it's, you know, to live comfortably, you're at $100,000 a year. Okay. So your passive income needs to achieve um, hundred thousand dollars a year and probably in excess of that, not probably in excess of that. Um, but remember when I'm talking about passive income, your capital is staying put and you're just living off of the returns on that. Like in the multifamily syndication in our, um, business model, we pay monthly. So your capital is never decreasing. So you still have that nest egg, if you will, but your passive distributions income from that is exceeding your, um, monthly or annual, um, cost of living. So that's the first step in achieving that. And once you have that number, then you can kind of do the math, right? So um, if you're a hundred thousand dollars, you know, I'll just, you know, I, I still use calculators because I don't have enough fingers and toes, but um, so if you're a hundred thousand um, dollars and you want to live passively, so you try to determine, you know, what are you investing in? Um, that this is one reason why uh, multifamily syndication is so nice is because it's a little more not a little more stable. It's a lot more stable. Uh, hopefully um, nobody in this group got burned on Dogecoin or any kind of cryptocurrency or whatever else the market is doing. Um, just, I stay very far away from it. Um, that's my personal strategy. So I know somebody in this group's like, oh, it's the best thing ever. That's great. Do it, make money. Um, that's not the way I play because I like nice, simple math. Um, so if you want um, that passive income, um, of hundred thousand dollars, you know, your and your average returns are, you know, 7% cash on cash. Um, and when I figure my returns, like in a multifamily uh, syndication, I don't consider the IRR. Uh, that's kind of a bonus to me. Uh, cause that's kind of my nest egg. When I get the capital return, plus all the equity upside, I that's, I'm going to reinvest that. So I'm looking at only the distributions. So typically your deals are going to be around the 7% cash on cash. Um, you know, we have some options in our um, portfolio where you can buy a class A share and it's 9%. So obviously that would change the math, but you'd need right around 1.5 million, um, you know, just a little under that to achieve, invested to achieve that goal. So um, that's in the LP side. So how are you going to get to that kind of nest egg? Um, so that's kind of the, the, the steps needed to get to your goal. So whatever you have right now, and that's what you're going to need. Let's just, I'm just using basic numbers here. But if you, if you, if you need to achieve $100,000 um, passive income to live comfortably, um, and that's going to be determined, obviously, on where you live geographically in the South, that's very achievable in New York City or, at, you know, in uh, San Francisco, that's not going to be very achievable. Um, but determine what your goals are. And then reverse engineer that to what you're going to need as far as an investment um, is going to be. So let's say 1.5 million. So how are you going to come to that 1.5 million? Are you currently working a job that is sufficient enough for you to put away that money um, to achieve that nest egg? Um, if so, great. Congratulations. Uh, a lot of people aren't quite to that level or many people aren't the average American, obviously, 
you know, the 99% are not achieving that yet. Um, so how are you going to get to that 1.5? And that's where a lot of you have realized that multifamily syndication is a way to do that because you can, if you are the operator, if you are the syndicator, um, you can um, achieve other sources of income besides just distributions like an LP investor does. It's like, and how does a person, you know, uh, make money on a syndication? Well, you know, fees is a, are a big part of that. Okay. So, you know, you get acquisition fees. So you, a certain percentage when you purchase the deal, that's on the total uh, cost of the deal, including uh, capital expenditures. Uh, it could be asset management fees, uh, not to be confused with um, property management fees. Property management fees are third-party managers that manage your properties. Um, it could be from, um, you know, construction management fees, which I've seen it go all the way up to 10% if it's vertically integrated. So you're not paying a contractor o o &P on top of the actual cost. You're doing it yourself. So you can charge up to, up to 10% on that. You, know, you can make money that way. Uh, disposition fees, uh, different things along those lines are ways that a syndicator can make money. So those are ways that if you're you know, working uh, a W-2 job or working your business and you, you want to exit that, um, you know, that's one way um, through syndication that you can do that. Or, you know, maybe you're planning to exit your current business and you want to get, you know, you're going to exit, you're going to have a, a windfall and then you can invest that and you're, you can achieve your passive income that way. Um, that is another way to do it. Um, but a lot of the time we, you know, people feel bottlenecked at this point in the game because they understand um, I think everybody here on the call understands, you know, the benefit of it, but how to get from point A to point B. How do I make this happen? Because all of us are busy. There's nobody, I don't believe there's anybody here that's just sitting around, you know, watching uh, soap operas, you know, just counting their bank account uh, go up. You know, that's not the way the world works. So we're out there hustling. You're out there, you know, uh, making things happen, working you know, uh, you're in your business or at your job and investing and trying to, you know, put your money to work while you're sleeping type mentality. And you want to get to this stage, but you know, there's doesn't seem to be enough time in the day. So how can you get to that point? Um, well, that's where you, you have to determine your comfort level with your work life balance. Okay. And that, that just depends on what you believe as a life theology, really. Um, what, why are you trying to achieve uh, financial freedom? I'm going to use that catchphrase, if you will. Um, I, don't, I don't think it truly exists, financial freedom, because things always change. You always need to be on your game. But, uh, you know, to be free to um, go on vacation if you want to enjoy time, you know, what is the goal? Is it to spend time, you know, you want to start another business maybe? Or do you want to spend more time with your wife, more time with your wife and children, uh, your husband, your partner, whatever the case may be? What is it that your goal is? that, you know, why you want to achieve this? Is it to accumulate? Um, you know, a lot of people do that. Just, you know, they want to have a nice boat, a nice car. That doesn't drive me, but uh, it does a lot of people. And they want to have, you know, that beach house or that, you know, uh, boat or whatever the case may be. And so that may be why. So you need to determine what the value of those goals are and what you're willing to sacrifice to achieve them uh, and what's important in, in the scheme of life itself. So, my personal opinion is, you know, family is everything and my kids are, you know, growing older every day and time flies and you hear that all the time, but it truly does. Yesterday, I, I literally uh, yesterday, uh, my oldest daughter got her driver's license and is now driving. Um, so she drove her siblings to school, um, which is, is nice, but, you know, that's a stepping stone and they're, they're, they're not getting any younger. So, you know, am I spending time with them? And is that something I'm willing to sacrifice so that I can never get back that time? Can I ever get that back to achieve something? And I'm not saying that's not the case, but you need to make a determination on is that cost worth the end goal? If your goal in the end is to be able to spend more time with your family, you know, maybe early on, you may sacrifice a little bit of extra time and, and you know, uh, to, to achieve that later on, maybe when your children are a little bit more uh, grown up or, or grandchildren or whatever the case may be. Um, so determine that. What is, what is your life goal? Kind of why do you want to do that? And what is the work-life balance? What are you willing to sacrifice? Um, you know, on a personal note, uh, I've met many, many people who um, are very professional, very hardworking, and they always, you know, are, are doing the next thing. And, uh, 
their whole life they did that. And now their, their children are, are grown um, and they look back and say, I wish I wouldn't have worked as much. And so, you know, that's kind of my standpoint. I want to spend as much time as possible. So that's my work life balance. And that's where it becomes difficult, right? Because you're, you want to achieve this goal. You understand the benefit of, of having passive income and you understand that multifamily is the way to achieve that. Now, what do I sacrifice to get there? So, uh, early on, um, that was a decision that I had to make because when we first started PassiveInvesting.com, you know, I was working another job uh, for a short period of time. And so my choice and sacrifice was to, you know, I never at five o'clock, I stop, I spend time with my family or, you know, a lot of times at 3.30 when the kids are getting home from school, I spend time with the family, you know, eat dinner, talk, whatever, put them to bed. Um, you know, talk to my wife for a minute and then go work again and you can work late. Or uh, my personal favorite strategy um, is getting up very, very early because um, my wife and children don't rise as early as I am. And so there was a point in my life when I was in insurance adjusting where, you know, when, uh, you know, you got to make hay while the sun's shining when a hurricane comes through or whatever. And, that, um, you know, I would go to bed at 11 and wake up at one. And I would do that for three months straight. Um, and just, you know, because it was unlimited income potential. And so, and it was first come first serve. And so I came up with a strategy and a system that would allow me to take on more than anybody else. And so I had to sacrifice probably a couple of years off my life to achieve that, but I didn't lose any time with my family. So I don't want to, you know, uh, belabor that point too much, but again, just determine your comfort level with work-life balance and what, how does that relate to your end goal? Is it contradictory to your end goal? So if your end goal is to have passive income and spend more time with your family, but sacrifice time with your family to achieve the end goal, it's counterintuitive in my opinion. So determine that, uh, determine, you know, where your comfort level is and how much time is left in the day for your side hustle. So that comes along to where you're at right now. Um, are you, um, at the point, you know, where you, you have a business and maybe you have a, a CFO or a CEO that runs that and you're just meeting quarterly, um, you know, or whatever the case may be. And you can, you can go ahead and start this kind of side gig and this become start become your main, um, thing. Um, that's very possible, or, you know, maybe you're in a high demand job and, and you have very little time. So you just have to just kind of segment out your day, your week, your month, your year, and determine, you know, what, um, you have left over and then determine how much time it takes to uh, run a successful multifamily business. And so this is really where I want to settle in a little bit is how much time it actually takes. Um, you know, when we first started, um, you know, when we got our first uh, property, you know, you're very, you've, you've read all the books you can, you listen to all the podcasts you can, but you know, experience is the best teacher. Um, and you just don't know what you don't know. I mean, you've heard that phrase and I hate to be cliche, but it is what it is. You know, you don't know what you don't know. And the only way you're going to know it is if you jump in. Um, and you've heard Dan say, uh, many, many times, you know, version one is better than version none. Um, and so you can always stop something if it doesn't, isn't working out, but don't sit here, but, you know, if you're sitting here today and you're, you're wondering whether you should take the next step or take that leap, you know, that moment of hesitation uh, where you think you don't want to do it because you're scared, just just jump. Um, I find that I, I think back to when I was a kid, um, you know, when we would go up to my uncle's lake, it's up in the Adirondacks in New York, and it's all surrounded by rock cliffs. Right. And it's, uh, you know, it's a lake all private. It's the only house on there. So it's very, very nice as, as a kid uh, being able to use that. And they had these big, you know, 40, 50 foot rock cliffs that you could jump off of. And, you know, that's, that's a huge height when you're small and, you know, th there's that moment when you're going to run and you want to do it. Right. And you know, that it's safe because you've seen other people do it. You've, you've seen, you know, how they jump and how they do it, but you know, you haven't done it yet and you get right up to the edge and you pull back. And then, you know, but if you just can just go ahead and take that leap and take action today, that's going to be very, very crucial to your success. Um, but when we first started, we took that leap and we just said, yep, we're going to do this. We got on a call and, and had that made that um, decision together. Um, you know, we just jumped in. Uh, it was just the three of us. We had no we did not have a team at first. And so we were doing everything, you know, all the accounting, all the tax prep. And when I say we were, Danny was doing all the accounting, all the tax prep. I was doing all of the um, CapEx. So I was literally calling vendors and 
uh, lining up, finding cabinet suppliers and finding different sources, you know, whether it's out of Indonesia or China or, you know, flooring, can we go direct to the manufacturer or where can we get the biggest discounts buying in bulk? Is it cheaper to buy in bulk and store it on the property or is it cheaper to buy in smaller portions? All of those things I'm working out. I was actually, you know, on site with tools, you know, working, uh, managing everybody, getting bids, uh, took a lot of times. So it was, it was, um, it took a lot of my day and I was able to do that. I was able to, to flex that, um, initially. And I'm not saying that's always going to be the case. You, um, our first property was, um, um, 133 units. Um, I may have been off by a couple of units there. 133 units, um, was that property. And so it was, it was, um, may sound large to some on the call, but it, where we wanted to go, it was small as a, it was our first step way to get into that. Um, you would not have that as much. Uh, maybe if you bought something that didn't have as much value add, you know, we were renovating all the units, pretty much gutting them, redoing the flooring cabinets, everything. So it was very high level. I think it was about 12,000 a door is what we had budgeted. So it was very hands-on. You don't have to get in at that level. So you will have more time, but think about all the things that you have to do. Um, you have to build broker relations. Okay. So that takes advanced um, planning and advanced phone calls. So you're having to make phone calls and, and meet with people, you know, can, do you have the flexibility to do that during your day? Are you having to do it at night? Are the brokers available at night? You know, so think through those things. Um, uh, building your team. When I say team, you know, you're going to need, um, you know, if you're going something a little bit larger, uh, maybe a property manager, or even on a, you know, you have a portfolio of single family rentals or whatever, uh, fiveplex, you know, do you want a third party manager? You know, you're going to have to find those people. Um, you know, all of those types of things are, you know, uh, you're going to, you have to have a, an attorney to do your uh, closings, real estate attorney. If you're doing syndication, you know, you have to have your SEC attorney. They may be one and the same, they may be different. So those things you have to be managing, um, I can say almost with certainty um, that it is near, I'm going to say near because there's some hard workers on this call and some of you are very capable. It is near impossible to start a multifamily syndication business on your own. You may have three, there may be three of you on the call and you, you already know each other and you're already working on something or two of you or something and you're, you're working off each other's strengths. So, you know, I am good at construction and, 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 negotiation and finding properties. That's what I do. Uh, Dan's good at marketing and, and personal, you know, PR and investor relations. That's what he does. Danny's good at spreadsheets and numbers. That's what he does. And nobody is good at everything. There's nobody that's good at everything. It's just, it's just human nature. There's no such thing as multitasking. You can only focus on one thing at a time. And the other things, if you try to do something more than one thing at once, um, everything else will suffer simul if you're doing it simultaneously. So regardless of, um, if you can do this on the side, I think you still need to have team members that are, are doing the same thing as you. Maybe they have another W2 job or they're an entrepreneur and they want to get into it and you're going to, you're going to help each other and distribute labor so that you can do it together and then you can reap the benefits. So if you're able to do that and you can allot that time, just think through the steps and what you're going to need, what kind of time it's going to take. And it's more than you think. Um, I'm not, I don't certainly don't want to discourage anybody here. Um, but excuse me, some people, um, on the call or on the webinar are, um, maybe thinking, you know, if I just buy you know, something smaller, it won't take as much time, you know, maybe a 10 unit, 15 unit. And I can, <laughs> I can say this without certainty that it is just as much work to buy a small property as is to buy a large property. Okay. So we've purchased properties anywhere from, you know, a couple million up to over 90 million. All right. And I can tell you that a lot of times the $90 million deal is easier than the $2 million deal. And you, and you make so much less on that in the syndication model. Remember your acquisition fees are based on the, the overall value of the deal, including CapEx. So think about, you know, for instance, let's say you have a 2% um, um, acquisition fee on 90 million or on 2 million. Okay. And, but if usually your smaller ones are going to be more hands-on, you don't have enough scale to have a third-party property manager, or if you do, you're paying a higher percentage. Um, so you're going to be putting a lot more time and effort into that. Whereas the, some of the bigger uh, cash flowing properties easy to run don't require as much time. So consider that as well. Don't just think smaller is better. And, you know, I need to start out small. Um, I think you do need to start out small because you need to build your reputation or your, 
um, you know, your momentum in the industry. And the only way to do that is to get that first property. It may not be the, you know, the prettiest, the nicest, but it gets you known to the brokers, gets you your foot in the door, if you will, um, and gets you started. Um, but eventually I think, you know, I think everybody should look to scale and scaling is really where this argument, um, this discussion, I should say of, can you do this as a side, a side hustle starts to become an issue. Do you, can you do it as a side hustle? Yes, most definitely. Many of you do it. Many of you are doing it. You're very successful. You work very hard at it. You're very proud of what you do. Um, but, you know, if you've ever looked at businesses, you always want to duplicate. Um, you always want to duplicate your process, right? What's, if this is working, if this model, let's say I, have, I bought a McDonald's franchise, right? I'm making, you know, $200,000 a year. I'm just throwing out numbers, you know, $200,000 a year. And I have a manager managing that and it's running. So what would I want to do at that point? I want to scale, right? I want to get another one and another one and another one and another one. And to do that, I'm going to have to build a team. Okay. I'm going to have, and then eventually that's, I mean, I, I have to focus on that. Like you can't necessarily be an absentee owner, um, if you will, because apartments are businesses. That's what it is. You're trying to, you're trying to streamline the business. You're trying to reduce expenses, maximize income, um, and in order to do that, you need to be very hands-on and then you want to duplicate that process. So you want to buy another property and scale a little bit bigger property and scale and keep repeating, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, and always be looking at a way, right. For you as the operator, as the syndicator, as the sponsor, whatever you, you want to call yourself to exit that business or to be passive. So you want to replace yourself as soon as possible. Let's say, again, we'll go back to the franchise model. Let's say you're, you know, you start a, a McDonald's and when you first get started, you know, you're very hands-on. You want to get, you want to, you need to know how the ins and outs of the operation work. So you're there, you're working with the manager or you're working with the, the, the employees and you're, you know, you're teaching them how to do it. Um, but that's great. And you will run a very successful store that way, but you can't start another one. If that's, if that is your mentality, you, you're going to have to replace yourself. So you're going to have to look to hire someone before you feel it's needed. That's the, the key to scaling. If you're, you know, yeah, I'm going to do it. I know I need to do it. I know I need to add somebody. I know I need a team member. I know I need a CEO. I know I need a CFO. I know I need a bookkeeper. Um, you know, that is, um, you need to do it before you get to that point. Say, well, this is working. In order to get from point A to point B, I'm going to have to do this. So let me go ahead and put that in place. And let me go ahead and make that investment. Not, not let me spend this money. Let me make that investment in the business model. So scale. So no matter where you're at, always be looking at how to duplicate your process to scale and how to remove yourself from the equation. Um, you know, the, you can look through history and people that, that do that, you know, all, all of the people that are successful in real estate or in business, um, they're not in there working day to day with their head down. Um, I'm going to give a couple book plugs here. Um, and many of you have read these, but if you haven't, be sure to do so. Uh, number one is essentialism. Okay. Uh, be sure to read that book. It's going to get, teach you to focus on the essential thing. And what, what is the essential thing? Is that your um, multifamily syndication business? Is that your, you know, your full-time W2? Is it your, your business you're currently in? You know, what is the essential thing? What is most important? Um, and focusing in on that. Um, for me, I'm type of, I'm a burn the ships type of person. That's the whole story of the I've used this many, many times, so forgive the repetition, but, you know, the general is invading an island and, you know, they're outnumbered, you know, whatever the case may be, two to one. And, you know, he doesn't want the his soldiers to feel that there's any option but victory. Um, they, no retreat, right? So he burns all the ships that came in and said, the only way we're getting off this island is if we are victorious or we die. Right. So I'm, I'm that way. I'm an all or nothing type person. I don't do things halfway. Um, that frustrates my wife sometimes, you know, cause, and I make decisions very, very quickly. Um, so I want to focus on the essential thing. I want to know what is it that I'm trying to achieve and then just drop everything else and do that, not drop everything else, but drop what is non-essential and focus on that. And that, you know, I talk to so many people and like, well, I just don't have time to scale because I, I I've got to, you know, I've got to schedule appointments and I have to work on, you know, my website and I have to, uh, you know, do the bookkeeping. Are you a bookkeeper? Are you a website designer? You know, are, are you those things or are you, um, you know, the business operator and find somebody to do those things that you are not, they're better at it. It's going to cost a little bit more, but it's an investment. It's a, it's well worth the money. So read essentialism. And then another one is 
who, not how. Um, if you haven't read that one, please be sure to do that. I've, I've implemented some of those strategies already as soon as reading, uh, as I got done reading the book, uh, and that gets down to the simple level of, um, the, for instance, I, my background is construction. I can do anything with regard to construction, framing, roofing, you know, electrical. I can do it all. I can save myself thousands of dollars. I've done so many, many years in my life. Um, but I got to the point, I'm currently in the middle of a kitchen remodel. I was doing all of it myself. I knocked out the back wall, added a porch, added the roof, and, you know, wired the whole thing, ripped out my panel, redid it all, saved myself a lot of money. But it was tying up my time and I was found myself being distracted from what I was supposed to be doing, what the essential thing was. And I needed to find the who and not the how. The how, you know, is, is how do I get my kitchen remodeled? And I need to say, okay, yes, I can do this, but I'm not the best. This is not my most profitable venture, okay? Saving that amount of money is not equal to what I can make in real estate. So I need to stop being distracted with what I can save and focus on what I can make and find the who to accomplish what I need to get done on my house. That makes sense to everybody. Um, so... Yeah. And somebody mentioned um, that uh, I think it was Dan Sullivan wrote who, not how, um, and he ghost wrote that had a ghost writer. So they're, they're implementing that process, you know, as, you know, as a writing the book, you know, uh, and saying, okay, I'm not a book writer. I want to write a book. I'm not going to say, how do I write a book? I'm going to say, who can I contact to help me write this book? And so maybe that's where you're at. Maybe you need to ask, who can I align with who can I uh, team up with maybe on this, on this webinar that can help me achieve my goals, not what. So, you know, maybe you're good at something and you need to find the who that can help you with the things you're not as good at. So that's the second book. The third book um, is going to be extreme ownership. Um, and that's the Navy SEAL, uh, Jocko Willink, and uh, I forget the second guy's name, so forgive me, but um, that talks about decentralized command. That's coming back to what I was talking about, about working in your franchise and having your head down. Like if you're working the fryer, right, you're not paying attention to how the customers are reacting to, um, you know, to different scenarios. Like maybe this, you know, cashier was rude to the customer. You're, you're not seeing all that because you're over here frying French fries. Can you fry French fries? Yeah. Um, is that what you are best at or what you need? So they talk about decentralized command and they use uh, war illustrations because um, this was the same um, unit that was had, had Chris Kyle. Um, as, um, I'm going to misuse the term, but it was um, Bruiser was the name of the company. Uh, maybe that's not the right term either, but um, overseas. And um, they're, they use these illustrations. They said if the commanding officer has his rifle trained on, on, you know, whatever they're firing at, then they're, he cannot see where the, where the enemy is. He's too focused on, you know, that he needs to let his um, sub, subordinate um, officers or troops focus on that. And he can be his head up, his gun port, looking at the situation and determining what is the next strategic move, right? So be careful. And that's all the whole mentality of work uh, in your business or instead of, or working on your business instead of in your business. So there's a lot of things in that book. And there's a second book that they wrote as well. It's dichotomies of leadership and it kind of balances those um, mentalities out. So um, that's going to be essentialism, who, not how, and extreme ownership, uh, as well as dichotomies of, of leadership or some great uh, books. So can you run a uh, a syndication business as a side hustle? Yes, you can. Um, you just have to determine your comfort level, your um, work-life balance. Um, if I mean, if you're young and you're single, I tell um, people this all the time. If you're young, you're single, um, you know, burn the candle at both ends, man. You got all the time in the world. What, you can sit around and play video games or something? Like work, you know, like you got nothing else to do. It, you know, if you have a, a wife, husband, partner, you know, that may change, you know, and so you may have to focus a little bit more on that person or as you add children to your family, that's going to change. But if right now you're listening to this and, and you don't have any of those tie downs, I mean, now is the time to, I mean, you can really make some huge leaps into your success. Um, so again, I just want to recap, kind of go down what we're talking about, determine what your financial goals are, how much do you need uh, to make, um, uh, how much do you need to have invested? Um, and some of you may have been confused on that, you know, say I was talking about LP investments, but I jumped right into being a sponsor or a GP. Um, we invest in every single deal. So I'm on both sides of that because why would I not? I mean, if I'm telling somebody that you need to invest in multifamily, um, I'm not, you know, that doesn't make any sense. Right. Um, and also don't want to put my money with someone who 
can't afford to invest alongside of me. Well, let me manage your money. I don't have enough to invest at the level you are investing at, um, but I promise you, I know what I'm doing, right? So that's going to be a problem. I hate to be a little bit candid about that, but um, you know, be be careful with that. You'll hear all sorts of groups say that's a misalignment of interest. I couldn't that couldn't be further from the truth. Um, so you can look at syndication and those acquisition fees, but look at putting those acquisition fees right back into the property on the LC, LP side. Um, and that's a way you can do that. Um, you know, we usually do about 10% of the capital stack um, on the LP side as GP partners. It varies per deal, you know, on the interest of the deal. So if we, um, we want to make sure our investors get first spot on that, but we try to do that. And I try to invest, you know, I try to limit my cost of living, um, to the point where I can invest as much as possible. So if you can do 80, 90% of your acquisition fees um, and build that, you know, whatever your nest egg is that you need to have cash flowing to achieve your financial freedom or your passive income to the point where you do not have to be at your job or trade time for money, then do it as fast as possible. Build that snowball um, as much um, uh, as possible. Um, and so I, I got, I want to jump into some questions, but let me recap. Um, what are the steps needed to get to your goal? So we, we, you know, determine that, you know, what is it going to take to get to your nest egg? You know, maybe that's acquisition fees. Maybe that's selling your business. Maybe that's working overtime, whatever the case may be, determine what you need and then determine the comfort of work-life balance. Um, how much time is left in your day for your side hustle after what you're doing right now? And, um, are you a risk taker, um, that you can just leave, um, you know, that you can just leave what you're doing. Um, I left what I was doing um, before we had our first deal um, because um, I don't know if you've ever read some, I'm trying to think of some of the books that mention this, but um, you know, always pay yourself first. I think that's in Rich Dad, Poor Dad, pay yourself first. Um, the, the idea there is don't pay your bills first because you're always going to short yourself in the end pay, you know, so if you want to achieve if you happen to save a certain, let's say you want to save 50% of your income, take that money out first and then pay your bills. Well, what if I'm short? Well, you're going to come up with a way to pay those bills if you're short, but you will always be reasonable with yourself and saying, well, I don't need to put as much money in savings because I just don't have it if you pay your bills first. So that was kind of the mentality I took. Um, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. So if I stop what I'm doing, I cease my income level here. Um, and I didn't have a large nest egg at the time. So, you know, there was some risk and there was some definite long discussions with my wife. Um, I have four daughters. And so, you know, that was a big uh, step for us, but I'm going to make it happen. Uh, you know, we're going to get stuff done. We're going to work hard. That's going to motivate me. That's going to make me work harder. Whereas if I have a safety net or a cushion, you know, I'm, I'm human, right? Uh, all humans have a lazy side to them and some less than others, but you know, I know that I have that within me. And so I want to make sure I'm holding myself accountable. So, um, and then um, how much time does it take to run a successful multifamily business? Um, at this point in time, you know, we have a very good team. You know, we have, you know, Melissa, you all know Melissa, she is phenomenal at marketing. We have Brian that does our asset uh, management, gets on the call with the, with the property managers. We have um, uh, investor relations. We have um, acquisitions team now. We have our self storage acquisitions team. All these people are working all the time. We have our uh, mortgage team on the rehab wallet. You know they're working constantly, and this is a team of multiple people uh, to make this successful and be able to scale. So eventually, if you want to scale, it's going to take a lot of time. It's going to take uh, a good team, and you will be able to step away from whatever your full time gig is now, whether that's a business or a W two. So. Um, Let's get into um, some questions. Uh, so the Q and A is where I look mostly um, at, um, you know, the questions, but I am looking at the chat too. So uh, some people have mentioned that, you know, I want to invest uh, right now, please uh, go to uh, passiveinvesting.com and go to the passive investing club link in current offerings. And that's going to get you signed up, put you on your mailing list. You're going to get uh, anytime we have a new deal come out, um, any new fund or new uh, investment strategy, you're going to get a notification of that. Whenever we have a new deal on the multifamily side, you're going to get an email uh, with a request to soft commit. And you're also going to get a, a beautiful, uh, professionally done uh, institutional quality uh, investor OM in the mail, uh, which Melissa puts together. She's phenomenal at that. It is hot, well and above anybody else's um, material out there. I can promise you that. And you can get flipped through and look at all the returns for that. So if you're interested, and I'm going, I'm just um, offering that here because um, somebody had asked about you know wanting to invest. So be sure to check that out and do that. Um, that's 
you know, obviously we're going to plug, you know, what we do because we want you to invest, but we want you to be successful. So if you've, if you've heard this webinar and you feel like it's way too much, uh, you know, I just want to invest in all the family, that's fine. You know, we can put your money to work for you and we can, you know, we can take the knowledge that we have and, and save you a lot of the hassle. But uh, if you're like me too, uh, you, you want to get your hands dirty. You want to be in it. You, you love it. And you like working hard. Um, you know, that's fine as well. Jump in with both feet. Um, all right. So um, let me scroll back up here. All right. So yeah. Who not how Dan Sullivan we had the um, Jocko Willink uh, for the extreme ownership, just going through some of the comments here. Um, through. Yeah, be sure to use, um, so they got like a specific project that was mentioned here. In the Multifamily Investor Nation Summit, they're going to have breakout rooms. Um, if you get the VIP, I think it's the VIP, um, mostly you can clarify in the chat, um, that you get the breakout rooms and you get the VIP chat rooms. I think that's more along the VIP line. And you can align yourself. So, you know, if you have, for instance, like a, a property that you're needing to syndicate and maybe you need a um, key principal or a loan guarantor, maybe you don't have the net worth and liquidity required to get the loan or you're new and you don't have the track record for Fannie and Freddie or whatever the case may be. Um, you know, you can meet up with people there and just, you know, it's just like an old fashioned, you know, uh, like we used to have before COVID where we meet in person and talk about the needs in the group. So you have a mastermind say, okay, what do you need? Oh, I need, a, you know, I need capital or I need a KP or I'm looking for deals and uh, here's a broker and they're looking for buyers. So, okay, you, you align interest and you, and you try to, um, you, you want to get your needs met, but your focus in, is on trying to meet someone else's need. And that's how you, you meet up. So be sure to check that out um, and, and go to the webinar uh, or to the summit and you're going to meet up with a lot of people. So if you have those needs, like the specific property mentioned here, uh, be sure to, to check that out. Um, yeah, VIP for finding partners or loan guarantors, um, check that out. Okay, I'm just looking, scanning through. Give me a second, if you will. And uh, so um, I, we were talking about alignment of interest, you know, just to get a little bit off topic of uh, GPLP. I uh, just want to get everybody's feedback. I know we had a, a comment on there about distortion of counterparty risk profile. Um, if anybody wants to expound on, on what you mean by that, um, or if you agree that um, not investing as a GP on the LP side is a misalignment of interest, uh, we feel strongly in that. And then I also feel strongly um, uh, that I should be investing my money uh, in real estate on the GP side. So like, take for instance, again, if I'm, if I have an acquisition fee and I'm saying, you know, this is what you should do, you should invest in this. And I'm taking that money and I'm putting it elsewhere. You know, people are going to, your investors are going to call and say, well, where, do you, where are you investing? Also, we invest in our own deals. We also invest in other syndicators. You know, I mean, there are a lot of other great operators out there. And, you know, we want our properties to be first and foremost for our investors, but we want to be aligned. We want to show them that, hey, we're in this too. You know, we're, I want, that's why we started this whole thing in the first place. Okay. We wanted a vehicle for our money that was tax deferred, you know, that we could uh, benefit from um, bonus depreciation. And so, you know, you start out investing on the LP side and then you're like, and I can do this. I know how to do this. I mean, you know, we know how to run a business, you know, and start scaling it that way. And so why would I stop now investing LP when that's what started it in the first place? And then again, you're going to run into that whole alignment of interest. Um, okay. So yeah. And somebody's mentioning you have to have money in the game, uh, so to speak. Um, and I, I agree with that. Um, if somebody is, um, you know, if somebody, you know, they're not going to put their money with you if you, you don't even have enough money to invest alongside of them. You know, and I know that's, a, that's something you have to get to. I don't want anybody to be discouraged and say, well, you know, I mean, my investors are investing $100,000. I'm not there yet. I just don't have that free and clear. Okay. You know, but that question is going to come up. And I think it's important that, you know, they feel confident in your ability to manage their money. You know, they have to know, like, and trust you. Okay. And the good way for them to trust you is if you uh, invest alongside of them. 
we have a question. Do you invest with SDIRA funds? Are you limited from being a GPLP lead? Um, I cannot invest with IRA funds um, in my own deals, the ones that I manage. Okay, that's against the uh, self-directed IRA regulations, um, and, but you can invest in others. And so I don't, I pulled all my money out of any IRAs um, early on and I just invest with cash because I just don't really, I get more benefit because I'm a full-time real estate investor. So it offsets any income that I have. And I don't get as much benefit from it if I use it through a self-directed IRA because you're not getting the benefit of the bonus depreciation. You're already getting a tax benefit. So you can't double, have a double tax benefit, if that makes sense. Um, all right, let me look again. And uh, a question, does one have to be an accredited investor to invest um, as an LP in your deals? Uh, no, not always. So we do 506 Bravos and 506 Charlies, 506B and 506C. 506C, we, um, you have to be accredited. 506B, you do not, but we have to have a prior relationship with you. Uh, we have to kind of, we have to know you ahead of time. We have to have a conversation, a meeting, a discussion. You have to understand who we are and know what we do and understand that. Um, so the best way to do that, um, if, if you're a sophisticated investor and not accredited is get on our mailing list. We, um, we do have deals often. Uh, and again, I can't, you know, publicly, uh, advertise for those here. Um, but if you get on our website, they're not listed there in the list because of that. But if you're on our mailing list, um, you know, we can get on a call with you. We can build that relationship with you and you can invest, um, as a sophisticated investor. Um, so thank you for that question. Uh, the multifamily investor nation, uh, conference is let me see if i can pull it, june 10th through the 12th uh coming up very soon uh so be sure to uh, register as soon as possible um okay and then uh, that is about all we have time for i apologize i have to catch a flight in about 10 minutes <laughs> so uh, uh i have to be at the airport it takes uh uh, seven minutes to get there. So um, I'm going to cut this one off here. Um, but as always, please uh, be sure to um, ask me any questions via email if you have them. Um, I was going to really quickly refresh this and talk about next week's uh, webinar. So this is uh, what you'll learn on this webinar with Danny Randazzo. Um, it's understanding your current financials, um, how to figure out where you want to go, taking action to get there and so much more. So he's going to expound kind of what I touched on at a high level. Danny is much more uh, technical. He's a money guy. I'm not, I'm very, you know, left brain type person, um, very visual. Um, so he's going to help with that. So roadmap to financial success, just a continuation of this. So be sure, sure to stay tuned to that. Danny's very, very knowledgeable on that. So, um, with that, uh, please be sure to email me any follow-up questions that I didn't answer on this. I apologize for cutting it just a bit short. Uh, Brandon, Brandon at PassiveInvesting.com. And be sure, again, to sign up for uh, the webinar. And I uh, hope everybody has a great rest of the day.